Good morning, guys, and welcome to another episode of The Angry Astronaut. And I know what some of you are probably thinking right now. Oh, here comes another clickbait. Fusion power by 2027. What's this guy smoking? He probably bought into another one of these crazy startup companies, etc., etc. Well, I got something to tell you. This looks really, really promising, and I'm not the only person who thinks so. This whole concept being created by Pulsar Fusion in the UK, and yes, I guess that's sort of a strike in their favor as far as I'm concerned. They've not only won over a lot of people in the media, including perhaps myself, but also the UK Space Agency, who have invested a substantial amount of money in their technology. And they have a multi-tiered approach to nuclear propulsion. And we're not just talking about nuclear thermal propulsion, cutting the travel time from here to Mars in half. Sure, that may be the short-term objective, but according to the founder of the company, Richard Dynan, the CEO of Pulsar Fusion, we are closer to fusion drives than anybody really appreciates. And he's got a pretty convincing argument working in his favor. But it's not just about the fusion drive. It's also about hybrid rockets in order to deploy the fusion drive in the first place. That is to say the fusion-powered rocket. So they have a solution to get it into orbit. Also, ion thrusters in order to deploy it properly because it's a multi-stage rocket launched in several pieces. So you got to have thrusters in order to handle that side of it. Guess what? They have a solution for that as well. That's been tested, by the way. We're not talking about CGI or something. It's real. And on top of that, the long-term solution for both nuclear fission-powered plasma drive and nuclear fusion-powered plasma drive. All of this sounds insane, but it is pretty compelling. But I have to admit, I'm also really pissed off about the whole thing and the whole company. I'll tell you why. The guy who founded it, He's not only rich, he's not only a genius, but he also looks like he jumped off the cover of GQ magazine. Check it out. So here's something that I find very compelling about Pulsar. They're not just taking care of one piece of the puzzle. They're taking care of all of the technology and applications that are going to be required in order to create a fusion rocket capable of getting to Mars in just a couple of weeks and even interstellar travel in the future. So what you're watching right now is several components, three to be precise, of a fusion rocket designed to go to Mars. And as you can see, these components are being propelled into low Earth orbit by conventional rockets. Well, not exactly conventional rockets, but rather hybrid rockets that run off of solid rocket fuel and nitrous oxide. This is not terribly different from what Skyrora is doing, although they are not using solid rocket fuel, but nevertheless using recycled plastic in order to provide propulsion for rockets in the future. And as you can see, this has applications beyond just deploying a fusion reactor in space. These kinds of rockets Rocket engines can prove very useful to European space flight in the future. And the reason I say European space flight is because Europe is incredibly concerned about green propellants and utilizing recycled plastic as a rocket fuel is very attractive to lots of different European customers. So what we're talking about with Pulsar is a company that's developing conventional rocket solutions in order to generate capital for themselves so that in the long run, they can create a type of propulsion that will revolutionize our exploration of the solar system. 
So here's the reason that Pulsar believes that they can get a functional fusion rocket before fusion power actually becomes practical. They don't need to generate a great deal of energy with the reactor in order to get the desired result. That is to say, all they need to do is generate a lot of high energy plasma, which a lot of the different organizations who have been experimenting with fusion have already done. Once you're able to generate the high energy plasma, you direct it with a series of electromagnets down to the engines, down to the nozzle, and then blast it out the end of the rocket at extremely high speeds. You get a lot higher ISP, a lot higher velocity of the propellant heading out of the nozzle, obviously, and therefore a hell of a lot more delta V. The rocket comes in three components that are assembled in low Earth orbit. You have the payload, of course, in the front, and then the fusion reactor combined with the electromagnets in order to both create and direct the plasma, and then the engines and rocket nozzles at the far end of the rocket. That's very simplistic, of course, but really we haven't gotten a whole lot more details aside from that. There are, of course, some problems with this concept as I see it thus far, but still let's go through the rest of the process. Once the rocket has achieved suborbital flight, it transitions to Hall effect thrusters or something similar to that, ion thrusters that will be capable of both driving the rocket components into low Earth orbit and also to maneuver them until they're able to assemble properly. And this is something that this company has already tested as well as I mentioned before. And one of the reasons that I feel so optimistic about this company is because of what they have already accomplished. A lot of this is based on tangible results, not on theoretical results. First of all, they have built and tested the most powerful electric propulsion engines in Europe. And to refresh you on Hall Effect thrusters, what they do is take an inert gas like xenon and krypton, run a great deal of electrical energy through them in order to ionize them, and then drive the ions out of the nozzle in order to achieve thrust. Since you don't have a great deal of energy with this type of thruster, usually just the amount of energy that can be generated by solar panels, you don't get a great deal of thrust, but you get a great deal of velocity, 27 kilometers per second, as opposed to four and a half kilometers per second that you get out of a chemical rocket. So the ISP is much higher as well. But as I say, since you don't have have a great deal of energy passing through these engines, you don't get a great deal of thrust, which means these things are only useful on satellites, CubeSats, that sort of thing, at least currently. Once you're able to hook these engines up to a lot more power, say a nuclear fission reactor for example, you get a lot more thrust with the same kind of ISP, therefore reducing the travel time to Mars for example to about 90 days instead of 6 months. Not exactly what Pulsar is looking for, but a great way for them to generate revenue as they work up towards their long-term goal. They can sell these engines to satellite manufacturers or perhaps to the European Space Agency if they want to send out some small interplanetary probes or probes to the moon, that sort of thing. These sorts of engines have a lot of applications, especially given the current state of interplanetary exploration. But once again, Again, this is just the short term as far as Pulsar is concerned. They're working towards a much, much more ambitious goal. So let's move on to their fusion propulsion solution. But first, a quick refresher on how fusion actually works. As most of you probably know, it's based on the principle of fusing atoms together rather than splitting their nuclei. And what they're currently trying to use to do that is to use deuterium and tritium, fusing them together in an environment that's 100 million degrees Celsius, in other words, a temperature that cannot be contained by any known material, fusing the atoms together and getting a tremendous amount of energy. The challenge, of course, is generating this amount of heat and this amount of energy and getting a positive result out of the reaction, which up to this point, they've only barely been able to accomplish. There is, of course, another problem as well. 
how the hell do you contain the material when it's being heated to this kind of temperature? Well, the way they do it is to create high energy plasma that is contained by electromagnetic means rather than any kind of physical material. And since you have this ionized plasma, this is what Pulsar is going to use for their propellant. Now, there is a widely publicized myth about fusion, that the reaction doesn't generate radiation the way that fission does. That is actually not true. As you can see from the diagram, a neutron is released with every reaction. That being the case, you get neutron radiation and a lot of neutron radiation every time you try to accomplish a fusion reaction. However, there's a way to avoid this. If you use helium-3 instead of tritium, Tritium. Then you get a much safer reaction that produces only a single proton instead of neutrons. However, there isn't a lot of helium-3 available here on Earth, but there is a lot of helium-3 available on the moon. And this is a fact that has not gone overlooked over at Pulsar, but we'll get to that in a moment. So once we get to the point where the rocket has achieved low Earth orbit, at that point, the components meet up and we engage the fusion reaction and then a tremendous amount of high energy plasma is blasted out of the rocket nozzle at speeds that could completely revolutionize the way that we travel the solar system. We're talking exhaust speeds of anywhere from 110 to 350 kilometers per second. In other words, 20 times the speed of chemical rockets. That being the case, if you can get about the same amount of thrust you can easily reach Mars in a couple of weeks and the Jovian worlds in a few months. And keep in mind, this technology does not require that the fusion reactor generate a great deal of electricity. You're not trying to power a city. You're not even really trying to power the rocket. All you're trying to do is generate the high energy plasma and enough power through the electromagnets to direct the high energy plasma in the desired direction. That's it which is a lot more achievable. And Pulsar, as amazing as this may sound, intends to carry out an in-orbit demonstration of this technology by 2027. And from a technological standpoint, there's no reason why they can't. But it goes even further than that. This kind of drive, a fusion drive powered by a much more efficient and mature fusion reactor, could theoretically reach the stars within a reasonable amount of time. We're talking Earth to Alpha Centauri in 11 years. As impossible as all of this sounds, the technology is achievable. The principles are well understood, and it could, in theory, give us the ability to to reach the stars before the end of this century. But let's get back to the Helium-3 situation. As I suggested before, Pulsar has ambitions of mining Helium-3 on the moon. As a matter of fact, this may be what China's trying to do at the moment as well. It may be the primary reason that they're so interested in the moon. Keep in mind that the Chinese have their own very aggressive fusion project, and they're also very aggressively exploring the moon, especially in terms of its composition. Perhaps they're more interested in finding where the largest concentrations of helium-3 are on the moon as opposed to the largest concentrations of water ice. Regardless of their motivations, mining helium-3 on the moon could change everything for fusion. Obviously, it will produce a far more efficient and far cleaner reaction free of most radiation, which of course makes a very big difference. As a matter of fact, my daughter was involved in an experiment associated associated with the ITAR project where they were exposing various types of machine oil to large amounts of radiation to determine which kinds of machine oils in a future fusion reactor would be the most practical and would be the most resilient when exposed to neutron radiation. None of this would be necessary with helium-3. Pulsar once again has recognized this and intends to use their technology to exploit these vast resources on the lunar surface, and we're talking about very valuable resources, at least $3 billion per ton. Subscribe! 
Hybrid engines, plasma drives, ion drives, interstellar travel, well, I bet you can see why I'm excited about all of this, but there are some problems, at least that my relatively untrained eye can pick up. First of all, I don't see how they're going to be able to get these three components into orbit without multi-stage rockets. These single-stage takeoff solutions don't really seem to be very feasible unless they can push a lot more performance out of these hybrid rocket engines than we think they might be able to. But you could, of course, still launch these three components on existing chemical rockets to get them into orbit. I really don't see that being a huge problem, but nevertheless, that is the most obvious thing that I see. And of course, the whole idea of trying to get a functioning fusion reactor into low Earth orbit by 2027, whether it's similar to existing fusion reactors or not seems like a very tall order. That being the case, though, I do think that this is feasible, especially with the appropriate funding. I really like this company's ambition. It's very exciting, very similar to the ambition that SpaceX has, to be honest, so I am definitely pulling for them all the way. Please subscribe to my channel. Also, please like this video. Check the description for various ways to support my content, and as always, Stay angry about space!